Okay, people are still joining. Okay, maybe slowly we can, I, I stop sharing the screen. Okay. Um, oops, so what's happening here? Ah, okay, hi. Sorry, <clears throat> good afternoon. Um, welcome to the NITEP mini school on, on quantum computing and today is um, part three. Uh, I think I don't need to, to, to spend much time introducing the speaker because you already met him, uh, met him twice. <clears throat> Just a very short uh, uh, introduction. Daniel Park uh, is from South Korea, but he did all his uh, physics studies, uh, his undergraduate and PhD studies in, uh, in, in Canada. After his PhD in Waterloo, he moved to KAIST, the Korean Advanced Institute for Science and Technology, uh, first as a postdoc and now as a, as a research uh, professor. Yeah? So Daniel, we are very, very happy that, uh, that you're here again with us <clears throat> this afternoon, this, this evening for you. And um, part three, if I remember correctly, is devoted to, to quantum algorithms. Yeah? And for those of you that might have missed part one and part two, you find them in, uh, in the, in the NITEP uh, YouTube channel directly there or following the, the links from the, the NITEP website. So Daniel, thank you very much. For, for offering um, today part three of your very interesting course. There are lots of people waiting for you. So please, if you want to start sharing your screen, uh, you're welcome to start. And um, sorry, and like um, in the past editions of the mini school, uh, Dr. Sinaiski uh, will um, moderate your questions after the presentation of, um, of Daniel. So please make use of the question and answer facility in the bottom bar of, uh, of your Zoom uh, screen. Yeah, Daniel, please, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for a uh, kind introduction and also thank you for having me again. Uh, so let me share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so okay, so today is a third lecture of the mini school on quantum computing. So, and as you already know, uh, unless unless this is your first time to to this mini school, so we've been uh, talking about some introduction to the theory of quantum computing, and and this was the outline of this mini school. So in the first lecture, uh, we just went through some, some background introduction, discussing what's uh, quantum information processing and why we care about it. And as a, as a part two, we, had, uh, we have three lectures. So, so last week, uh, we, I, I introduced a quantum circuit as a model of quantum computing. And today uh, is devoted, as, as Francesco said, today is devoted to uh, a, a short introduction to quantum algorithms. But before I delve into quantum algorithms, I want to uh, just review what we have discussed so far, especially last week. So if you were here last week, you will remember that we, uh, I made a comparison between classical computing and quantum computing, just to kind of uh, give you um, the, 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 the right pictures, right picture to see what quantum computing is about. And uh, so, so, so it turns out that quantum computing is very, looks, looks very similar to classical computing, especially classical probabilistic computing, okay? Uh, because even in classical computing, when we are doing, when we are doing a deterministic uh, computing, everything is straightforward and like we, we are very familiar with this concept, but there is also probabilistic computing in classical computing. Uh, and there now uh, the information could be, is given in probabilistic mixture of being zero or one. OK, 
Okay, and then now in 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 this model, uh, we we express our uh, information using like a vector state vector formalism, which we had to use for uh, quantum computing as well. And um, so, in the end. Uh, you know, this quantum computing seems very similar to classical probabilistic computing, but the key uh, difference, very important difference, is that in classical computing, we, we are dealing with uh, probabilities. So the, and the probabilities has to be non-negative real number. But in quantum computing, uh, we are dealing with probability amplitude and this probability amplitude could be any complex number, okay? Uh, but, you know, uh, whether we're doing classical computing or quantum computing, uh, we, can, we can describe the dynamics of uh, these quantum bits or classical bits as a matrix uh, multiplication. So we, so we just need to, we just need to have linear algebra to see. So the evolution of these bits could be expressed as uh, multiplications of, you know, stop, uh, uh, you know, transition matrices in classical probabilistic computing and the unitary matrix for quantum computing. Okay, so we uh, we concluded that uh, this uh, the quantum mechanics can be viewed as a mathematical generalization of the probability theory. Okay, and. And the big big question was, so okay, so how do we how do we actually implement this idea of quantum computation in physical systems? And for that, we need to think about models of quantum computing. Um, and there are four uh, like well known models of quantum computing. And uh, in this mini school, we only focus on the circuit based quantum computation where the unitary evolution of the quantum state can be represented as gates, okay? And then so we just saw some elements of quantum circuit. And then we use this circuit representation to represent presentation of quantum information and dynamics of quantum information and, and the measurement, okay? And uh, I just want to point out again that this circuit model is very useful for for many reasons. But first, it gives us a very it gives us a very clear notion on how to uh, analyze the computational complexity of a given algorithm, because here uh, the physical resource phys physical resources are uh, the number of qubits which we normally write in this direction, and also the number of gates, which goes along this direction. So basically, we, when, when we're given some, some algorithm and we want to know the computational complexity of it, uh, we basically just decompose uh, this algorithm into you know, the number of how many qubits we need and, and how many, we basically just count the number of qubits and number of gates, okay? Uh, and also another nice thing about this circuit model is that uh, so it has very close connection to the actual physical implementation. So for example, if we want to now, so when we have this, this model of quantum computation, then now um, all we need to do is we need to, uh, we need to choose the actual physical systems that can encode quantum information. So we discussed this a little bit. So if we have two level quantum system, then we can use that to encode quantum information. And we need just after that, we just need to worry about how to do certain gates physically in order to perform quantum computation. And in relation to that, the concept of uh, universality is very important. So this uni the, the concept of universality is also very important in classical circuit model. So uh, basically what this universality is about uh, is that, you know, 
you want to do some arbitrary uh, quantum quantum gate, okay, some some arbitrary transformation of quantum information, and it turns out that when we have some finite set of gates, so this is just one example. So for example, if we have, this is called Hadamard gate and it looks like this. This basically prepares uh, an equal superposition state if we're just given either a zero or one. And if we are given a superposition, equal superposition state, we, we change it back to a zero or one. So let's say we have Hadamard gate and have some sort of uh, this T gate is some 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 phase gate and this controlled X or actually this could be replaced by controlled C gate. So these are two cubic gates. So now if we have these two single cubic gates and one two cubic gate, this set constitutes a universal set of gates. So by uh, uh, by combining these gates, we can we can approximate any arbitrary unitary uh, transformation. So this is very useful again because you know now if somebody wants to manufacture a quantum computer, uh, the manufacturer does not have to worry about making a device such that all possible transformation can be implemented, but only need to worry about uh, being able to implement these three gates, okay? So that's what's also happening in classical compu compu uh, computation. Because in classical computing, you also want to implement arbitrary Boolean functions. And uh, you just need uh, like a NAND gate and fan out gate. So if you know how to do them, then you can do any arbitrary Boolean uh, operation. So this is very useful, okay? So this is what we uh, discussed last week. Um, and then now we're gonna go into some new stuff. But before I talk about quantum algorithm, I also want to introduce you a very important concept in quantum computing. So, uh, okay, so the question is, is it possible to copy an unknown quantum state? Okay, so, now let's let's uh, let's move a step back and ask if it's possible to copy an unknown classical state. Um, and actually, that question is very easy to answer. I mean, if we want to copy an unknown classical state, yes, it's possible. Like actually, we do it a lot. You know, you 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 can you can photocopy something without looking at the content of it. So it basically it's possible to copy classical state, but it turns out that this is not possible for, uh, for an unknown quantum state. And this is because of the intrinsic property of quantum mechanics. So just to kind of show you why it's not possible, let's see, let's say, uh, let's suppose the copying is possible then there has to be some op some some copy operation and then this has to be unitary because we this is a quantum state so there is this unitary operation and then by doing this operation we should be able to start from just a single copy of this quantum state we should have two copies of quantum state right so this is by definition what we what, what we mean by copying uh, an arbitrary state okay but then now we can write this single qubit state like this. This could be some arbitrary. So we can we can just express any arbitrary single qubit state like this, right? And then now, what happens if we apply this copy operation? Then if this statement was true, and let's just write this down. Um, then what happens is by linearity is this. So this is what we should get. However, uh, now we go back and look at the definition of the, the, the wave function psi, and we can immediately recognize that this state that we get from this copy operation is actually not doing, uh, 
the copying as we want. Okay, so we can immediately see that the copying is not possible. So this concept is very important in quantum communication, quantum cryptography, and quantum error correction, and so on. So in, in my first lecture, I, I mentioned that when we do quantum computation, now we change rules, right? So this is one example where we have to change the rule. So, so the rule is that we cannot copy an unknown quantum state. So I also mentioned by changing the rules, uh, we can do some things better, but some things becomes more difficult. So this is one part. So actually for quantum cryptography, uh, this no cloning uh, theorem, meaning that we cannot copy an arbitrary quantum state, is, it helps. But for doing quantum computation, where we need to be able to do quantum error correction, we'll see next week that this, this gives us difficulties. Okay. Okay, so now let's go and I'll, I'll introduce some elementary quantum protocol before going into more uh, sophistic sophisticated quantum algorithms. Okay, so let me uh, ask another question and you can kind of think about this. So how many classical bits of information can be sent with a qubit? Okay. Um, okay, so by uh, sending a qubit, so remember a single qubit state could be written in this form. Uh, it actually turns out that only, um, you see, it seems like when you look at the quantum state, it's, at first glance, it seems like the information that's being encoded in a single qubit is very rich, right? Because it's alpha and beta could be any complex number. So, you know, um, if you're not careful, you might think that by sending a qubit, you can probably send infinite amount of information because these are any complex numbers, but it turns out that it's not true. It turns out that you can actually only send one class, you can, you can communicate only one classical bit of information by transmitting one qubit. Why is that? Because, you know, uh, as a receiver, you have to make a measurement to, to gain some information. And as we saw from the measurement postulate of quantum mechanics, if you make a measurement, you measure only either zero or one with a probability given by alpha and beta, right? So like you, you, you get one state and you make a measurement and you, you measure zero or one, so that's only one bit of information. And remember just the slide before, I mentioned that you cannot copy this state. So as a receiver, you cannot just receive this state and then make many copies of that. Okay, so you cannot do that. So, um, so okay, so now it seems like, okay, by sending, you, you send one qubit or one classical bit, it seems like there is no difference, okay? But now it turns out that if you have entanglement, entanglement allows for two classical bits of information to be sent by sending only one qubit. So suddenly it seems like entanglement acts like some sort of um, resource for doing communication or for better, for, for more powerful uh, transmission of information, okay? So let's see how this works. So let's say we have uh, an antelope in South Africa and we have a beaver in Korea and then they say they, they met in some conference so they, they were able to generate entangled state, two qubit entangled state. And then um, after this conference, they uh, decided to keep one qubit each and they, they go back to their countries, okay? So, so this entangled state is shared between two, two parties that are far away. So now uh, Antelope wants to send some classical information to Beaver who is far away. 
So for that, uh, antelope can do some unitary operation that encodes this classical information that, that she wants to send to her friend, okay? So, and then after applying some unitary operation to, to her qubit, uh, she sends her qubit to Beaver. And then now, so by doing that, uh, now Beaver has both two qubits, right? He already had one qubit, now he received another one from, uh, from her. And then now he makes a two qubit measurement. And because this is a two qubit measurement, there are four possible outcomes. And by looking at these four possible outcomes, uh, Beaver receives two classical information. Okay, so we can see it as follows. So uh, remember uh, this antelope choose, chooses one of these four unitary operations. Okay, and now it turns out that uh, when, when A applies the, one of these unitary operations, then the state uh, changes. And, and so, so obviously there are four possibilities and it turns out that these four are uh, orthonormal to one another. So uh, when we have orthonormal states, uh, we can do a single measurement to distinguish them. So it seems like um, B is doing some two qubit gate. This is controlled, not controlled X and the Hadamard and measurement. So this whole thing actually could be could be uh, looked could, could be considered as as a, as a as a measurement procedure, and then typically we call this Bell measurement. So now you can see that what uh, it's measured by Beaver is different depending on what A has done before transmitting her qubit. So there are four possibilities. So they were successful. Uh, in uh, communicating two classical bits of information using uh, entanglement, okay? Um, okay, so now uh, let me ask another question. So how many uh, classical bits should be sent in order to communicate the state of a qubit, okay? So now we are familiar with uh, this single qubit state. So basically we want to communicate this. How many classical bits do we need to uh, transmit? So first, uh, because you know, this alpha and beta, these are complex numbers, it seems like you need to, and also remember when you send uh, and, 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 and now, um, if we really want to communicate what alpha and beta in infinite precision, it seems like it seems that we need to communicate infinitely many bits uh, to communicate an arbitrary quantum state. Okay, but again, in this scenario, entanglement helps. So it turns out that when you have an entanglement, uh, a quantum state can be sent by sending only two classical bits of information. So this is another example where uh, entanglement somehow acts as a resource for doing better communication, okay? <coughs> okay, so let's see how this works. So again, so we have an antelope and beaver, they, they share this entangled state, but antelope also has another uh, single qubit state that uh, she wants to communicate. So, so all together, uh, these make three qubit state, right? There are two qubits and there is a single qubit. And uh, it turns out that when you're given an arbitrary single qubit state with a disentangled state, you could be, you could, you could kind of rearrange, you can re-express this state in this form, okay? So what are these beta 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 are? These are 
the two qubit states. And it turns out that this beta 0, 0, beta 0, 1, beta 1, 0, beta 1, 1, these four two qubit states, uh, they, they're orthonormal to each other, okay? And now you see that, this, that the third register is either psi or psi with an x operation or psi with a z operation or psi with x z operation okay so you see this three qubit state is now written as a superposition state that's spanned by this orthonormal basis and for each orthonormal part uh, this information about psi is encoded but with some extra operation depending on the, the orthonormal basis, okay? So remember uh, A was sharing entangled state with B, but also A had a single qubit that she wants to communicate. And now she has to send classical information, right? So now what she does is uh, she, uh, she makes two qubit measurements. So remember this, C naught gate plus Hadamard gate and two qubit measurement. This was called Bell measurement. So she performs Bell measurement. And remember, and now you see because when you look at the first two qubits, they're orthonormal, right? So so she will obtain either zero 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 one one zero or one one, right? But also remember when you make a measurement, the measurement there is a back action, right? So that will change uh, the quantum state, there will be the, the collapse of wave function. So if, if A measures zero, zero, the remaining qubit on, uh, on, on the, that the beaver has becomes psi. If uh, A measures zero, one, then B gets x multiplied to psi. And now when one, zero is measured, then beaver has z multiply to psi and if a measures one one then the state that's remaining in with beaver is x x z multiplied to psi so there are four possibilities okay so now uh, knowing that uh, a after making a measurement if she she measures zero zero then she just tells beaver okay i measured zero zero then in order to recover psi, beaver does, just does not have to do anything. And then if uh, A says, okay, I measured one, one, uh, then beaver knows immediately that, that he has to apply X and Z in order to recover psi and so on. So by communicating these two classical bits, beaver knows exactly what local operation he has to apply in order to recover psi such that uh, the psi, the quantum information that originally uh, was in the possession of A has been transmitted to B, okay? Okay, uh, so I see there are a few questions, so maybe I'll stop and I'll try to answer these questions. Uh, yes, so the first question is, Please, what information have been sent by the antelope? Uh, so um, I think the question was referring to... Uh, super dense coding, I think. Probably super dense coding. Um, it's just any two... So here it was just a two classical bits of information. Uh, she wants to send... Uh, zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. So there are four possibilities, right? So these four possibilities could encode any, I don't know, any four possibilities. I don't know. It could be like, you know, you know, you, you can, you can, you can, you can use these bits to represent any four different possibilities, right? So for example, like, you know, let's say, as an example, like let's say uh, they were supposed to uh, meet tomorrow, meet uh, for uh, lunch tomorrow, let's say. 
So zero, zero could represent a restaurant one, zero, one could be restaurant number two, one, zero could be restaurant number three, or, uh, and so on. So, so by sending these two bits of information, you can communicate which restaurant out of those four will we meet for lunch tomorrow, for example. But it, it, it's just one example. So basically, they communicated two classical bits of information. And then there is another question. Uh, yes, and another question is, how do we decompose a state in a bell basis and express the components of the iterator? I think that refers to uh, quantum teleportation. So probably this part. So now uh, when, remember this psi, uh, this is a single qubit state. So we could just write it as alpha zero plus beta one. So that's one way of writing a single qubit state. And, you, and then this beta zero zero is already given like this. So when we have alpha zero plus beta one tensor product with this guy, you know, it's just like you just express the whole thing. And then you just, you, you just have to rearrange uh, the equation and you will see this is one way to rearrange the state. You'll see that these two are equivalent. Okay. Okay, so I'll move on. Okay, so we saw uh, some basic uh, quantum protocols and we saw how entanglement could uh, help us to do uh, better than what we were able to with uh, classical method. And, and now we're going to go a little bit deeper and see how we can uh, we can use quantum uh, the laws of quantum physics for doing uh, computation and the first lecture we already did uh, i'm kind of showing this again from the first lecture remember that when we have uh, multiple qubits the uh, the dimension of the state space increases exponentially with the number of qubits, right? So when we had one qubit, there are two, two, uh, two computational bases, so there are two complex amplitudes. When you have two qubits, there are four complex amplitudes. When you have three qubits, there are eight complex amplitudes, and so on. So now, let's say, for example, let's say we have 70 qubits. And there are roughly like 10 to the 21 complex amplitudes in superposition, right? So meaning that we can process such a large number of complex am amplitudes in parallel by doing quantum computing. And then if we kind of convert, convert this to the, the unit that we're familiar with, it's like 10 to the nine terabyte. Okay, so, so you can see that uh, if we want to express, uh, if we want to use classical computer to express what's happening with 70 qubits, I mean, first of all, you need enough memory to store this many, this much information, okay? Because there, there are just so many uh, complex amplitudes to be stored, okay? So this is already kind of, so you can kind of already guess that quantum computing should be really powerful. However, there is a problem. Uh, we already saw that the measurement destroys quantum superposition, right? I mean, so, so now we have quantum computation, which allows us to process humongous uh, number of complex amplitudes in parallel, which is, which is beyond classical capabilities. But in the end, you make a measurement and you only get one outcome with certain probabilities. So if you naively encode your answer to uh, one of these amplitudes, um, then there is like a small possibility that you will get the answer, but there are also exponentially many possibilities that you would get wrong. Uh, sorry, so there is a very small possibility that you get the right answer, but there's also exponentially many possibilities that you will get wrong answer. 
So it seems like just having a humongous number of complex amplitudes in superposition is not very useful because of this measurement uh, postulate, right? However, uh, I also mentioned that there is a solution and then we really need to exploit quantum interference in a, in a smart way, okay? So, uh, so now it turns out that quantum computing could be really useful uh, because, because now we can use interference effect unlike uh, classical computing. So remember in the very first slide, today, which was a review of the last week's lecture, I mentioned that because unlike classical computing where these numbers are probability, which is non-negative real numbers, uh, since these are any arbitrary complex numbers and they can interfere constructively and also destructively just like waves, um, we can perhaps, we can manipulate and we can engineer this quantum interference effect such that the probability of obtaining the, the right answer uh, amplifies while the probability of obtaining the wrong answer uh, decreases throughout our algorithm. Okay, so that's one way of designing an algorithm. We'll, we'll kind of discuss this in the very later. So you can kind of apply this when, even when there is like no particular structure to the problem. But it turns out that when there is no particular structure to the problem, and if you just naively apply some sort of uh, uh, amplification procedure to exploit quantum interference effect to really uh, constructively increase the probability of the right answer, the, the quantum speed up is only quadratic. So it's not exponential speed up. So we'll kind of, I'll mention this again later. But now when there is some structure to the problem, which we'll see in the next examples, then we, by, by using some structure of the problem, we use the quantum interference effect to, for example, find some sort of patterns among uh, many numbers, for example. Uh, some, you, can, you, can you can use this interference effect to find some global property, okay? So for that, for such uh, problems, for, for some of those problems with the uh, internal structure of the problem, and when you're only interested in finding some global property of the problem, then uh, quantum computing could provide exponential speed up. Um, so one thing I'm not going to go into too much detail, but, uh, but that I mentioned in my first lecture is a Shor's algorithm, which is for which, which gives us the exponential speed up for uh, factoring, okay? Um, and there exactly we are using the structure of the problem to speed up the process. And it turns out that this factoring problem can be reduced to finding a period of, of a given sequence of numbers. So, so this is, you know, this is a global property, right? You're given you're given so many uh, sequences, you, you're given a long sequence of numbers, and then you want to find a period, okay? So, so quantum computing can do such type of task really well, and that's, that's why um, a quantum computer was very successful for solving a uh, factoring problem, okay? Okay, but uh, in this lecture, we're going to look into two specific algorithms as an example. So one is uh, Deutsch Joza algorithm, and I wanted to discuss this because it's actually the first, uh, it's the very first example of a quantum algorithm that performs better than the best classical algorithm, okay? So uh, it's, I mean, historically it was very important because it showed that there can be advantages uh, to using a quantum computer as a computational tool for a specific problem, okay? Okay, so what's, what is this problem? So, so here we're given some unknown Boolean function that maps n bit string to uh, a single bit. 
And this Boolean function, there is a promise. So there is a structure to this problem is that this Boolean function can be either a constant or balanced. And when we say constant, it means that this function will output the same bit for any input. Okay. So you see there are n bits. So the input is n bit string. So there are two to the n possible inputs. And it doesn't matter what goes in as an input. If this is a constant function, the output will always be the same. And now if this is a balanced function, then for one half of the input strings, the output is zero. And for the other half of the input string, the output is one, okay? So the outcome is always 50% of chance, it's a zero, 50% of the chance, it's one. Okay, so now what's the problem? You have to really keep in mind that the problem is not to find what F is, but the problem is to, 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 to figure out whether this function is constant or balanced. So, so we're really looking for some global property of this function. Okay, so what do you need to do classically? Uh, I mean, now we're gonna talk about the worst case scenario. And then you see, even if this function is balanced, uh, sorry, constant, in the very worst case, you cannot be sure that it's a constant function or a balanced function unless you try more than one half of all possible inputs. Because by, I mean, the probability is really low but by bad luck, it may be that the function is balanced, but then you, you continuously just sample zero all the way until you hit like one half of all possible input stream. Like, I mean, it's very unlikely to happen, but it could happen in the worst case, right? So in the worst case, you really have to try more than one half of all possible inputs. And you see there are two to the N possible inputs. So the number of trials that you have to make is exponential with respect to the problem size, which is n, because it's like two to the n. But uh, if you use quantum computing, it turns out that you need just one query to solve the problem, okay? So how does it work? So this is the quantum circuit for that. Uh, okay, so so these qubits here, the, there are n of them, okay? And then there is some extra qubit here, with, which will be explained soon. But now we apply Hadamard gate to all, the, the, all, all of uh, n qubits. So by doing that, uh, you know, we basically, all of these n qubits become an equal, equal superposition of zero and one because we applied Hadamard to zero. And then this, you, if you expand it, this is basically an equal superposition of all possible input, two to the n inputs, okay? And then we had this extra bit there. And what is this big black box? This is some unitary operation that maps when you're given some input like this. Uh, this function will map the input such that the output uh, contains some information about this Boolean function. I mean, this Boolean function is unknown from us. So, so this is some sort of black box operation. And then we basically have to figure out whether this uh, black box function is is constant or balanced by looking at the measurement statistics. Okay, so after the quantum state go through this black box, uh, it's all, or in comp uh, computer science, you also call it an oracle because it's just something that's given to you. So after going through this oracle, uh, uh, the quantum state that you get can be expressed like this, right? Because if psi one was that, we just apply this rule uh, and then this is what we should get, okay? And remember this uh, function f is just zero or one. Remember this was just zero or one. So we can actually re-express it like this, okay? 
So, 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 I mean, all now, like, all, this could be a little bit intimidating, depending on your background, but you, you don't have to understand all the equations step by step. For now, later, uh, I'll share my um, slides. You can take a look. Also, you can kind of look into other references that I gave in the, in the first lecture. Okay. So, but now, okay, so now this, uh, uh, f and x is either zero or one, so we can written, we can write this like this. So now it's interesting that we have applied some operation to the, the final qubit, but then what has been encoded in this final qubit could be factored out as some sort of phase in front of the total state, and then and then be written like this. And then typically this is called a phase kickback in quantum computing language. So if psi two, we can rewrite this like this. And then uh, again, we have to multiply, apply this Hadamard gates again. And the final state that we get before performing the measurement looks like this. But now we're measuring this first n qubit. So we're not measuring this qubit anymore. So this was only there to kind of transfer this phase that we receive from this oracle. So we don't care about the last qubit anymore, but we only measure the first n qubit. So this is n qubit state. Okay, so that's what we measure. And then now let's say, so this uh, z could be any n bit n qubit state, uh, n qubit computational basis state. But let's for now focus on z being uh, uniformly zero, okay? So now for that, you just need to put zero there. So this term goes away. Then the amplitude, the probability amplitude for this particular computational basis state can be written like this, okay? Now, if this function was constant, then this is always zero or always one for all possible inputs of X. So you see, if this is constant, then it constructively, this, this amplitude constructively interfere such that it always add plus one all the way or it adds minus one all the way. So the, the sum becomes either plus one or minus one. But remember when you make a measurement, we only care about the modulus square. So the probability of measuring zero is one if this function was constant. Okay, that's interesting. But now what happens if this is balanced? Remember for, for, uh, for two to the n possible inputs, this could be one half of the time, it could be zero. One half of the time, it could be one. So basically we have one half of the terms being plus one and one half of the terms being minus one. So now they interfere destructively to cancel each other out. So this alpha zero, the ampli probability amplitude of this zero state is simply zero, okay? So, in summary, we, we perform this type of circuit. And then in the end, we measure these n qubits. And if we measure zero, then we know the function was a constant. But if we measure something else, because, because the if the function was constant, then, the prob then this has to be zero. Like the probability to measure this was this as zero was one. But then if this function was balanced, then the probability to measure zero was zero. So when we make a measurement, we'll measure something else, right? So this is how we can uh, distinguish whether this function was constant or balanced. Okay, so remember, uh, just to kind of make, just to uh, summarize, uh, remember the goal was not to learn the unknown function itself, but to learn its property, whether constant or balanced. So for this type of, for doing this type of uh, tasks, uh, quantum algorithm can be useful. And then in, in deterministic classical algorithm, you need uh, roughly like exponentially many queries in the worst case. 
But then it turns out quantum algorithm solves this problem with only one query. We used quantum superposition and constructive or destructive interference. But then now uh, to keep in mind that when we, when we were uh, comparing to classical algorithm, we're only looking at the worst case. But then you can also consider a probabilistic classical algorithm. And then, I mean, even though uh, it, it's possible that uh, you, uh, given a balanced function, it's possible to receive uh, the same bit over and over, the probability of such uh, sequence is very unlikely, right? So, um, you know, when we just do random sampling, uh, and if we constantly get the same number, then with a the high probability, then we, with a high probability, I mean, not 100% sure, but with high probability that we know this, this function is constant, okay? So it turns out that if we kind of uh, look for not 100% success probability, but just a, some, some constant success probability, like let's say we want to uh, make sure that our prediction is 90% correct. Then it turns out that only a constant number of queries is required instead of one. So now the separation of this complexity is not as uh, exciting. Okay. Um, so the next algorithm that I want to discuss is actually now this is the first so the Deutsch Josa was the first algorithm to show that there is some advantage of using quantum computation. But now I'm gonna show another example where this is the first algorithm to show that actually there could be an exponential speed up uh, versus the best classical algorithm for solving a specific problem, okay? Um, and it turns out that even though we won't discuss the Shor's algorithm in detail, it turns out that uh, this algorithm inspired uh, the invention of quantum Fourier transform, which is the key ingredient of the, the, the Shor's factoring algorithm. So this is also a very important algorithm. Okay, so let me uh, quickly describe what the problem is. So again, we're given an, a block box or an oracle which computes some Boolean function. Now it maps n bit string to m bit string. And um, there is some hidden uh, bit string s, okay? This is something that's unknown from us, but uh, there is some hidden structure within uh, the function such that uh, uh, there is a collision if the input is simply shifted by this amount, okay? So we see this is if and only if. So uh, when, when, when we sample from this function and if we receive the same outcome for two different inputs, then we know for sure that they are related by this uh, relationship. So, so, so this, this problem is also, you know, it's, it's like finding some sort of pattern or hidden structure within the problem. Okay, so of course now the task is to, to determine S by making queries to F. Okay, uh, how do we do it classically? You just basically have to you know, try uh, random inputs and you repeat until we get collision. And then, so whenever we find two inputs, two different inputs that gives us the same output, then we know these two inputs satisfy this relationship. So we can, we can basically uh, calculate uh, the hidden bit stream. It turns out, uh, you know, even though this is a random sampling, it turns out that you actually need to try the number of uh, trials increases exponentially with respect to n, which is the length of the bit string. But with quantum algorithm, you can just query um, uh, many times and you can do, you apply, you apply some post-processing. 
and you can achieve exponential speed up. Okay, so now this is a circuit that increments that. So again, so we have MD string with Hadamard gates. And now, unlike the Joza algorithm, we have Mbit uh, register here. Okay, and then again, this, this uh, black box is some oracle that implements uh, this unknown Boolean function like this. Okay. So now uh, we look at psi one after applying this Hadamard gates. This is a state. This is what we get. We apply this oracle. We just follow this rule. This is this is what we get. But now remember, for uh, two different inputs, there is a pair of inputs that gives us the same output, right? Remember that, right? That was uh, the structure of the problem. And these two inputs uh, that gives us the same output is related by this hidden bit string, right? So we can actually write this in this form. We, we don't know what S is, but we can, at least we can write it down like that, okay? So for either X or X plus S, the output is the same. So now, uh, you see, if we now measure this m bit, right, m qubit register, uh, because of, of the measurement postulate, uh, when you look at the state after measurement, it will collapse to to one of them. So this is a superposition of many possibilities, but it will collapse to only one of them. And then we. So now after making measurement, uh, this n qubits collapse to one pair of possible answers. And then we apply Hadamard again, and this is the state that we get. And then it turns out that this amplitude is non-zero. It's kind of obvious to see that this dot product has to be zero. Uh, this, this, because this is a binary inner, inner product, right? So this is either zero or one. And then, so this has to be zero to make sure that uh, this amplitude is non-zero. So, you know, you uh, basically what we have to do is we just basically we measure this n qubits. And what happens is that when we make a measurement, we get some random bit string Z there are some possible uh, bit string z, but they have to satisfy the condition that the inner product of z with s is zero. So you get some random bit string that satisfies this condition. Okay, so we we uh, apply we repeat this many times, right? Then we get uh, let's say we repeat this k times, then we get k uh, a random bit string but all of them satisfy this condition. So now we can, we can, when we have many number of them, we can do like Gaussian elimination to, to solve this linear equation for S. And it turns out if uh, these are NB string, you know, we just need like something in the order of N samples to, to solve for S, okay? So we made uh, n queries to uh, the quantum circuit. And then we also need to do some sort of uh, classical post-processing for doing Gaussian elimination. But you know, the, 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 the key point is that the scaling is only like linear and polynomial with respect to n uh, instead of uh, exponential with n as in the naive classical algorithm, okay? Um, yeah, so I'm actually going to skip these slides and just go to the summary. Um, so, the, 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 and I'll explain the, the slides that I skipped in this summary. Uh, yeah, so in this lecture, we looked at some elementary quantum protocols and we witnessed that quantum entanglement provides some advantage. So it was very, it was uh, some, it, it wasn't, it was a key ingredient for achieving quantum advantage. And, and uh, we 
also went through some quantum algorithms. So we looked into two specific uh, examples. And then these examples uh, had some structure in the problem. And because there was some structure in the problem, we could engineer quantum interference to achieve quantum speed up. And then the, the very last example that I didn't show, which I actually kind of explained earlier, is a problem where we want to find an answer when there is no structure to the problem. And it turns out that there could be speed up for such type of tasks, but uh, it's known in theory that the best speed up you can achieve is only quadratic if there is no structure to a problem. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop here and I'll take questions. And uh, next week I'll talk about quantum error correction. Yeah, Daniel, thank you very much for the, uh, another exciting lecture. Ilya, are there question, more questions from the audience? Uh, not anymore. Maybe the audience will came up with questions just now. Okay, okay. Let's give them a, a minute to, to, to think and, 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 and formulate a question. <clears throat> So Daniel, maybe you want to use the, 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 the one minute while the, our participants think about questions, if they have any, to give us a, a little preview of, uh, of next week so that we make sure that they all come back again. Ah, yeah, so, uh, so in, my, uh, in the very first uh, lecture of these mini schools, I mentioned that there are two uh, theoretical pillars to quantum computing. First uh, is, is quantum algorithms, which I, I discussed today. Uh, and basically quantum algorithm tells us uh, that, uh, you know, what, uh, it tells us that quantum computing could be powerful. I mean, it could be, uh, it could be useful. But there is also another important aspect, which is, uh, which deals with uh, the feasibility of quantum computing. So, so one, on one hand, we need to we need to be sure that quantum computing really gives us some advantage. Okay. So, so the answer to to that question is is partially answered by the development of quantum algorithms and quantum protocols. But we also have to answer. Okay, it's, it's fine. So, this quantum algorithm could be advantages in theory, but is this really realistic? Is it really feasible to realize quantum computation? And that's also, uh, at least in theory, it's answered by uh, the theory of quantum error correction. So what it says is that uh, in, so, so fundamentally, it should be possible. Like fun fundamentally, there is no reason uh, there's nothing, nothing that stops us from uh, making uh, a working quantum computer. Uh, of course, there is some hardware challenges, but in theory, it should be possible. So, so that will be the main focus of the next lecture, and then that will end the mini school, because this is really about the theory of quantum computation. Okay, Daniel, thank you very much. Ilya, I think uh, one question popped up. Do you want to take care of it? Yes. Is it always possible to engineer quantum interference for any given problem? Um, not for, I mean, for any given problem, you could probably come up with a way to solve the problem, but in, it's not always clear whether it will be uh, advantages. So it's, uh, it's one, I guess it's one of the big questions in, in this field. So what kind of problems uh, uh, should we really uh, try to solve? Because it, it, might, it might be that you could still, you could solve, you could solve the problem using uh, quantum algorithm by using interference effect, but 
it could be that you know there is no point of doing that, or maybe it's even worse than doing the best classical algorithm. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think today's participants uh, enjoyed uh, your very clear lecture very much and are quite um, scared of asking questions or they don't need to ask questions because they understood everything. Um, but since Daniel will be with us again in a week's time, should uh, any questions pop up, feel free to send us an email and, uh, and we will make a plan to, to answer and, 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 and reply to it. Mm -hmm. Then Daniel, uh, again, thank you very much for, um, for sharing with us further knowledge about quantum computing. And Ilya, thank you for the moderation of the questions. And we will see you again all next week at the same time at two o'clock on, uh, on Tuesday for, for the last part of the mini course. And then next week I will announce you the secret new mini course for, for August. Yeah? So stay, stay tuned. So thank you very much, everyone. Daniel, have a good evening in, in South Korea and um, a good day to, to, to all of you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye now.